Okay, so welcome everyone to this information session uh, about the design phase of the Hassanda program. Quick housekeeping before we get started. Um, this webinar is being recorded. Because we're using Zoom webinar as our platform, you can't turn on your camera or mic uh, unless the Zoom host allows you to. Uh, there's going to be a Q&A section and when we get to that section we may uh, invite people to turn on their cameras and mics to ask questions. Uh, just be aware that if you do, your voice and image will be recorded and will be published. Uh, you can ask questions via the chat channel or the Q&A channel. Um, if you do that, please know that you may be identified by name as we respond to your questions. So if you wish to avoid this and remain anonymous, you can ask a question anonymously in the Q&A window. Uh, and if you want more information about our privacy policy, you can find it on the ARDC website. So to begin our information session today, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet. Uh, I pay my respect to the elders past and present of the Ngunnawal people. Uh, I'm uh, joining the meeting today from uh, Canberra in the Australian Capital Territory. So today we're going to have a presentation followed by, followed by moderated Q&A. Um, as I said, please add questions to the Q&A window or to the chat channel as we go along. ARDC staff are going to be monitoring those channels and collating the questions uh, for the session following the presentation. The purpose of today's webinar is to give an overview of the next phase of the Hassanda program and how you can be involved. A number of you will already be familiar with Hassanda and its progress, but there are many of you here today who aren't familiar with it. Uh, so before I hand over to my colleague Grace, who will be discussing the design phase uh, in particular, I'm first going to give a brief summary of Hassanda and our current progress. So ARDC, or the Australian Research Data Commons, uh, is a national research infrastructure organisation. We were established under the Commonwealth Department of Education's National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy, or more simply, NCRIS. ARDC's role is to enable the Australian research community to access nationally significant data-intensive digital research infrastructure, platforms, skills, and collections of high quality data. Hassanda uh, is one of ARDC's strategic initiatives formed under our National Data Assets Program. Uh, Hassanda stands for the Health Studies Australian National Data Asset, and its high level goal is to partner with the health research community to build a national data asset from the outputs of health research studies. The purpose of this data asset is to support data sharing and secondary use of data in order to increase the value and impact of health research and the investment into health research projects. Ultimately, we're aiming to facilitate better health outcomes for the Australian population by facilitating new research and research translation. So prior to the formal launch of FASANDA last year, ARDC held preliminary discussions with some peak national health research organisations. Uh, those discussions identified an opportunity for us to help improve data sharing from clinical trials, clinical quality registries, cohort studies amongst many kinds of health research areas in order to improve the impact and translation of, of research. ARDC subsequently invited uh, these organisations and a few additional key bodies to form an advisory committee for Hassanda to provide feedback and advice on ARDC's strategy uh, and the direction of the Hassanda program. Based on discussions with that advisory committee, ARDC selected investigator-initiated clinical trials as the initial focus for, for Hassander's infrastructure and as a proof of concept of what we're trying to do. Uh, this area of research meets our criteria for supporting research translation, uh, but it's also one of the more mature health research data communities with respect to data, standardized, uh, data standards, standardized methodologies, community coherence, and organizations. So what this means is that there's a shorter path between uh, where that particular clinical trials community is up to in their data sharing capability and what Hassanda will deliver. And so they were considered a good candidate for a proof of concept for the infrastructure we plan to build. So ARDC as an NCRIS organization, uh, 
our timelines must follow their roadmap cycles. So the current Hassanda program end date is mid-2023 to align with the current MCRITS roadmap. This initial program period for our proof of concept is thus focused on clinical trials, as I said, for our starting point, but we expect that come the new NCRIS roadmap, which is currently under consideration, the Hassanda program will continue well past 2023 and will expand beyond the current focus on investigator-initiated trials. But investigator-initiated trials is where we're starting. It is also worth noting that ARDC is not trying to build an infrastructure here that we will own or operate, but instead our goal is to build capacity into Australian research organisations and communities so that they can share long-term ownership over this national data asset. As you'll see, the approach we're adopting for this program is one of consensus building and co-design with those communities and stakeholders. So as you can see on screen, the current program has four main phases. <clears throat> We've almost completed the first phase, which is our initial consultations. The purpose of these was to engage with key stakeholder groups and the broader research community to build consensus on the purpose, priorities and value proposition for this national infrastructure. These consisted of workshops with health researchers, clinical trialists, research participants and health consumers, and other professionals in this space, such as infrastructure providers and policy makers. Uh, I note that many of you here today have been or are currently involved in these consultations, uh, and so thank you for the contribution you've made thus far. In parallel to this, over the last few months, we put out an open call to research organizations to establish what we're calling nodes in our infrastructure network. In a moment, I'm going to explain what a node is and what our infrastructure design entails, but it's important that I acknowledge that a number of attendees here have been part of that application process and are currently awaiting the outcomes of those applications. And just to let you know, we should hopefully be in touch very, very soon about that. So the next phase of the program after the initial consultations and the one we're here uh, today to discuss is the design phase. The purpose of this design phase is to establish the specification for the data asset and the infrastructure we will be building. And I say we because, as I mentioned, this is a consensus building co-design process that will include the voices of the different stakeholder groups in this space. Once we have co-designed the infrastructure with you, the nodes that I just mentioned before will implement those designs at their organizations and start uh, building this national infrastructure network. So that's that development phase. You can see that will be happening uh, predominantly next year. In the final phase of the program, the final six months, we will be testing and deploying the infrastructure. So that's the quick overview of our timeline. I'm now going to uh, delve into a little more detail about where we're up to for those of you who are newer to Hassanda. So as I said, we're coming near to the end of the initial consultations. Um, the first consultation workshops were held last year. These were open workshops, but were mainly attended by clinical trialists and health researchers. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare were consultants for this process, and the workshops established some foundations for Hassanda. Firstly, we identified the primary research purposes uh, for a national data asset. These were, as you can see on screen, systematic review and meta-analysis, uh, replication, reproducibility, and peer review, and secondary research projects and analyses. Uh, these were identified as the three top priority, priorities because uh, in turn, these things can facilitate policy development, new study design, health technology assessment, and clinical guideline development. So uh, the research translation uh, goals that we have for the program. Uh, the consultations last year identified the categories and types of information about clinical trials uh, and the information generated by clinical trials that were required to support these research purposes. Uh, there is definitely metadata and documents about trials that are essential to secondary use, but the overwhelming priority that we heard um, in, from those stakeholders uh, was the ability to access participant level data. So having pinned down the purpose and information needs for the data asset, we also sought feedback on the concerns and incentives around creating this kind of data asset. Uh, some of these were around the resource cost and changes to work practice, but understandably, the strongest concerns were around how best to provide access to data and how to do this ethically and with the appropriate consent from research participants. However, 
overall, there was overwhelming support for the Hassandra initiative uh, because almost a complete majority saw the benefits of data sharing, uh, whether that was to broaden the reach and impact of their research and their research networks, or to get better information to inform clinical practice and guidelines and therefore health outcomes, or even if it was just to make sure that they are compliant with their funder and publisher policies. Um, I think in general terms, you can say that people see both the carrots and the sticks in data sharing uh, and an, an initiative such as Asanda. Um, but understandably, this is a relatively new and confusing area for a lot of health researchers, uh, and they don't want to have to figure it out on their own if they don't have to. Um, so we also received a lot of feedback and support for Hassanda to involve and coordinate between the different stakeholders, not just the researchers and participants, but also the institutions, uh, the policy, uh, policy makers and publishers too. The feedback received was collated into a set of guiding principles for Hassanda by an editorial team of health research experts and professionals and reviewed by the organizations forming our advisory committee. To take this further, we're currently completing a second round of targeted consultations with research participants, health consumers and trialists to allow them to review our approach. Based on these consultations, ARDC identified three development priorities that form the foundation of our infrastructure design. So the first thing to emphasize is that Hassandra is not going to be a new data repository where clinical trialists have to hand over or deposit their data and documents. Uh, we believe that that kind of solution would be, would be problematic because it's not always easy to hand over data due to ethics and governance issues. But also research organizations have generally already built a lot of data systems to manage their trials, uh, data and documents. They may be electronic clinical record systems, they may be repositories or catalogs, uh, but in general, trials aren't starting from scratch. So what Hassander will do will be to federate these different systems distributed across Australia. And there are three pillars to doing that. And that's what's on screen at the moment. So. Uh, First, and this is the box on the left, there needs to be agreement on the kinds of data that should be part of the data asset. There needs to be a common framework for requesting and granting access to data. And there needs to be the appropriate ethics and consent in place. Building agreement on this is what we call coherent data practices. So we have to use somewhat abstract terms here at ARDC to, um, so that we're not using jargon specific to any one particular domain. Um, so the coherent data practices uh, uh, is what we will be delivered uh, by the design phase of the program. And the design phase, as I said, that's what we're here to discuss. So once these agreed practices are designed, researchers in their organizations will then need to adapt their practices and their data systems accordingly. As I just mentioned, we're currently reviewing applications from groups of organizations or what we're calling nodes. So that might be a conglomerate of universities, of medical research institutes, maybe of clinical trials networks, uh, who are putting their hands up to lead the way in doing this, to implement these new, uh, these new standards of practice. Uh, and they're going to be uh, implementing these uh, national standards to form a network of what we're calling coordinated data services. So that lower blue box. Once this node network is established, we can then build the federal uh, federation layer on top of this. This layer is what ties everything together so that someone looking for trials and their data can learn quickly and understand what is out there uh, and request access to the data. So before I give a concrete example of what this might all look like, I just want to make clear that we are not asking trials to hand over their data and that there will be a governance process around who may access data and how they may access it, because obviously to do anything else is going to be inappropriate and highly unethical. Um, instead, the nodes uh, will be providing non-sensitive metadata about their trials uh, and data into the, in, into the data asset, uh, including information about whether the data can be shared and how people can request access to it. Okay, so, I'd now like to switch to some examples and hopefully this is going to work for me. <clears throat> okay, maybe Reese, if you can give a quick nod, can you now see Vivli on screen? Okay, great. Okay, so Vivli is a platform um, to enable sharing of data from clinical trials based uh, in North America. Um, it's 
targeted mainly at uh, pharmaceutical trials. Um, my apologies to attendees from Vivli if I'm misrepresenting uh, your platform, but it's useful enough now for this description. Um, so as you can see, you go to the Vivli website and you see an interface that allows you to search for clinical trials. You can search by keyword or they have some existing um, uh, categories or search filters you, you can set. So I'm just going to randomly click a few here. Hopefully this returns some results. No, that returns zero results. Let's just take this off. Okay, so we've got some results. And what each of these results is, is a different clinical trial. If I click on that page, on that link, you can see it's loading some details about the study. And if I had click on any one of those links, it's going to provide the same standardized fields describing what that study is. And some additional information here, uh, administrative information, including uh, the registry, the clinical trials registry that, um, that the trial is registered with, and so on and so forth. So the point there is essentially that we've got uh, one simple easy platform to look across different clinical trials uh, and see what's there and there are mechanisms within Vivli to request access to that data. I actually haven't uh, logged into Vivli here so I'm a bit limited in what I can show you. So what I'm going to do uh, is quickly switch over to a different um, platform. Now this isn't in the clinical trial space but I like to use this one um, because it, it works well as a quick on-screen demonstration. So this is a platform for sharing data from cohort studies, specifically dementia cohort studies uh, called Dementia Platform UK. Um, you can see that they don't have the same kind of search interface but what we see on this, on this page is a listing of uh, all the dementia cohort studies um, that are listed with this platform. If I go and click on one of those studies to find out more information about it, you see the tab here, Available Variables, and we'll see a submenu here. And we can see what they've done is actually for all their participant level data, that they have group the variables into uh, some categories. I think most of the health researchers here, uh, this makes intuitive sense that there's socio-demographic information, family history information, and so on. And if I click on one of those, it's actually showing me um, that metadata about the IPD. So what kind of variable is it? Um, is it actually included in this data set and so on? So that's a fairly highly structured uh, and detailed um, uh, data sharing platform. Um, they're able to do this because they're limiting their scope quite a lot. As I said, cohort studies within dementia research um, and they have some very um, granular standards in place for what data is to be shared and, um, uh, and the formats for sharing that data. Um, but they're just two quick examples. And hopefully now, and Reese, I'll just get you to give me a thumbs up again if we can see the slide deck now. Excellent, good, everything's going swimmingly. Um, okay, so that was uh, two very brief examples just to, just to get it in your minds, a picture in your minds, what's, what's going on here. Because I realized what we were talking about before was somewhat abstract for a number of you. So let's take a look back now at that infrastructure design. Um, and if we look at the Federation services, so what Federation services are, that's ARDC Lingo, um, a generic name for those Vivli type websites that allow people to search for trials and data relevant to their research. Um, and those websites give information and direct people how to request access to data. So the way that a service like that works. Now, like a Webjet or a hotels or bookings.com site, 
what that interface is doing is actually searching across a network of service providers, or in our case, organizations, uh, research nodes who hold clinical trials data. So what an end user sees when they use a platform um, is a catalog of the holdings at the nodes. The platform itself isn't holding participant data or trials documents, that stays with the trialists or their organization. The, uh, the, what the platform is doing is displaying the non-sensitive metadata about the trial and its data holdings. So as most of you will be able to guess, the nodes are gonna hold lots of different kinds of data from different kinds of trials. So the way a system like this works is that there will need to be agreement about the standards on the categories of data and how they're catalogued and described in the system. In addition, to make the process for requesting data more streamlined and efficient, there will need to be agreement on a framework for that process. For example, what kind of information must an applicant provide when requesting data? Who should be reviewing those applications? And what are the terms and conditions if access is granted to the data? And to facilitate sharing of data in that way, there's going to need to be an understanding of what ethics and consent approvals need to be in place. There will be an obvious difference here for already completed trials who did not obtain consent when they were running their trial. Uh, that's gonna be different for clinical trials in the future. Indeed, the consultations that we're holding uh, and have completed already revealed a strong appetite for the development of a robust standard approach with clear procedural guidance to obtaining ethics and consent for data sharing that Australian trialists could adopt to make this aspect of their research practice simpler and more efficient in the future. So the development of these kinds of standards, or again, our, our um, jargon, coherent data practices, uh, the development of those standards, uh, standards that can work at a national scale and be endorsed by the range of uh, stakeholders from researchers and trialists to participants and health consumers, to institutions, funders, policymakers. These standards are what we will be developing during the design phase of the Hassand program. And when I say we, I mean all of us, not just ARDC, this is a co-design process. So, okay, at this point, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Rhys Williams, who will be helping to coordinate the design phase uh, and is going to give you an overview now of our approach and let you know how you can be involved. So Rhys, I'm going to move us forward onto the next slide and you just let me know as we need to move through. So just keep going, I think, Kristen, to the next one. Um, so the design phase, as Kristen said, the way we're going to do this is um, with a series of working groups, which is the where we'll need, obviously, you guys to, to contribute. You'll see here the names of the four working groups. And these are the four elements that some of, the, some of them, Chris has just alluded to, that really will go into collecting together that those sort of coherent data practices. So the information design component, meaning the, the metadata model, what it is, those metadata fields that will absolutely be required for all nodes to contribute to the, the catalog, if you like. Uh, and the standards that, of, of the data collection and the data reporting from the clinical trials. And that includes not just the individual patient data, but all the other documents that are associated with the trial. So the, the trial protocol, um, the consent and um, ethics approval process and whatever other agreed um, suite of documentation is that forms the, forms the data set for a particular clinical trial. So that's the information design group. The data access group uh, is going to be concerned about the flow of data from the nodes to the, the federated services. Um, what type of access is appropriate? What's the process that will be that that um, particular need, people will need to go through to request that access? Um, that will need to be in, in broad terms agreed. Uh, we'll need to consider things like data sharing agreements, intellectual property agreements. If there's licensing issues, we don't know what sort of trials, but some of them may there may well be issues around ownership and about um, conditions under which the data can be shared or not. So that group will have to tackle those issues. Um, I should say, I should have said um, that these four groups will run at the same time. They'll all run in parallel, um, which we can do provided we will we'll have that interplay and I'll discuss how that, we hope that will work in a minute. The ethics and consent group, that, that one will actually run a bit longer than the others. Um, it'll, it'll continue to run into the development phase, but I'll come back to the time frame in a sec. Obviously, that's a big one, and the first stage of that group's work will be to identify the current 
scenarios around ethics and consent. Obviously, everybody's doing those now, but they might be doing it slightly differently, using different processes, different forms, uh, different workflows. Uh, but ultimately, we'll need a set of recommendations um, and some resources and perhaps some training materials um, so that every node working in within the standard program will be collecting that in a consistent way and at least a compatible way. It doesn't mean everybody needs to use necessarily the same form, the same as you don't necessarily need to use the same database to keep your IPD data. Uh, but we will need to do it in a way which means there'll be compatibility and transferability of data across nodes. And finally, the technology group will start to delve into some of the details that will be required further down the track. Things like, do we need libraries and tools to connect systems together? Um, they don't have to write them, but they, have, they will have to identify what those tasks are, what those tools will need to be. Uh, exchange and metadata, for example, crosswalks between systems, that, that kind of stuff is what the technology group will do. Um, we can come back to questions if people have got questions, but that's enough for the minute. Next slide, I think, Kristen. Um, the other thing we, as a starting point, have done is just develop a set of terms of reference for these groups, um, and those will obviously become available when the groups formed in the, which will be in July. Um, but broadly, this is what the groups uh, will look like. Will there be um, there will be a chair? Um, which will be an AADC staff member. The AADC will be responsible to convene these groups um, to manage the documentation and the minutes and the, and the other records and, and the, the operations of these groups. So the AADC will provide the chair and that administrative, if you like, capacity. Uh, there'll be a representative of each of the nodes. So if we've got 10 nodes, which will be announced, I'm not, I'm not sure how many there'll be because Kristen is involved in that process and not me, but whatever, whatever the nodes are, say there are 10, there'll be one representative of each of those 10 nodes on each of the working groups. Uh, and then there'll also be um, subject matter experts for, the, for one of a better description. These are people from the organisations that Hassander and ARDC have been working with for some time, people like the NHMRC and the AIHW and the, and the clinical trial uh, centres that Kristen's already mentioned. Uh, and, and, and as required, we'll have people with expertise in ethics or particularly technology elements. Um, and if the group decides as it progresses that it's short on a particular capacity or a particular skill or particular technical knowledge, we can invite others on to make sure that collectively with the ARDC's knowledge and the, and the, and the, S, and the, um, the node people who are doing the work now and the SMEs, we've got all the things we need to, uh, to make the right decisions and to have the right discussions. Um, the deliverables obviously for each group will be will depend on those four groups that depend on the domains in the previous slide but in general what we're expecting all the groups to do is to have really productive conversations gather all the information from the sources they need um, to provide advice look for risks look for rec and, and ultimately make recommendations uh, prepare a, a document of some description they'll have to work out the format but in the end the, oh, the point the whole point of this is at the end of this they will provide a set of recommendations to say, this is what we need in each of those domains to end up with our coherent data practices that will enable us to build the system. Uh, and in general, the approach will be, as I said, in, in, involved discussion. It, when we say co-design, that means that unlike a lot of projects, we don't know exactly, we know broadly what the scope is, as Kristen's described, but exactly what the solution is, we don't know yet. Uh, exactly how it will work. We're really relying on the expertise of you collectively, you guys on this call, and obviously others who uh, will be involved. Um, so it's a very collaborative and agile process. Uh, it's focused on ultimately we know what the stakeholders want. We, we've done in our collaborate in our initial consultations um, with the stakeholders. We know that that's the focus we need to concentrate on, and so that's going to be uppermost in our mind. So it's very much a stakeholder-driven, collaborative, agile process. Um, I think that's good enough for that one too, Kristen. Um, I've mentioned the timetable a little bit. Uh, the next step obviously will be the announcement of the nodes, which as Kristen said will happen soon. Um, I would have thought in the next week or so. Um, and so we will look to start the groups in July. Um, and we're suggesting that they'll need, they'll probably meet 
approximately fortnightly. Each group will sort, will sort out its own timetable, but that's the expectation. We're looking to finish up to towards the end of November, perhaps the very beginning of December. So that, in anybody's language, is a very short time frame. hence the notion of fortnightly meetings. If they need to meet more often, that's, that's up to them. Uh, in between times, of course, as the coordinators of this, AIDC will make sure that the chairs of the working groups get together outside of that. And if we need to bring two groups together for a meeting, we can do that. Uh, we can schedule other sort of sessions as required. But as a minimum, people should be looking to look at a, you know, a fortnightly commitment um, of a couple of hours and probably some extra work outside that as required. So if, if you're that's the sort of expectation we had. But the good thing is it is compressed into quite an intensive period of time. The development phase we expect to start in December or in January, and as Kristen said, run for a 12 month period. Uh, but the design phase will be finished by the end of the year. Um, as a starting point for the co-design process, we've actually got quite a lot of material for this. So we're not starting from a blank slate. We've obviously got the user scenarios and the value proposition work that was done as part of the consultations. We've got the input that's coming from the current sort of targeted round of consultations. We'll follow that sort of consensus building approach. Uh, and, and, I've, and as I said before, um, the recommendations. And then by the end of the year, we'll have essentially what will form a part of a specification to hand on to the developers. Um, we will have technical expertise from developers woven into these platforms. So if someone proposes to do something that isn't gonna work, we will have an idea. Um, so we won't be stuck with a situation where we get to December and ask the developers to do something and they'll say it's not possible. So it'll, it'll be that iterative process um, throughout. Um, and next slide, Kristen. Um, so what we would be, what we really love people to do would be given that background information, register their interest if they'd like to be part of one of these working groups. Um, and it may be that you're on the call now and you're part of a successful node and you'll find that out shortly. Uh, or it may be that you're just interested anyway. Um, in, in, and you're part of an SME or any other organisation. And even if you haven't had contact with the Hassander program so far and this is of interest to you and you've got something to contribute, we would genuinely love to hear from you. Uh, and to, to register your interest, if you follow that link or scan that QR code, you'll be able, you'll take you to a form that, so you can provide us with some basic contact details. Um, and that, that's open to anyone. Um, and if it turns out that um, you, you, there's a sort of two way, you end up putting your hand up as part of the node, that doesn't matter. We'd just love to have uh, the names now so we can start to work through and start to populate the, uh, the working groups. I think that's probably enough from me, um, but I'm very, obviously take questions and Q and A reminder that if you have a question, if you would like to put it into the Q&A window, uh, that would be really helpful. Um, and it's not too late to do that or into the chat window, it's certainly not too late to do that. If you want to do that now, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Okay, thanks Rhys. You can hear no, me in fact, okay? I've got a, I can. In fact, there was a first question, wasn't there? That yeah, there somebody's is. Asked me. Yeah. yeah. So, so I can see that Mark's asked the question out when I, I said transferability between nodes. Well, actually, that's not strictly the terminology I should have used because we're not transferring the data between nodes. But what I mean, what I meant by that was um, the ability to, to what do you, how do you say it, Kristen? To, it's, so the metadata has to be put into a common place. Therefore, all the metadata must be in a common format and that will be held within a, a repository. But the, but the, the it's, um, the ability to, from the federated layer to know consistently between nodes the same the same information and what's available and does it apply to um, IPD and other things it applies to all the data associated with the clinical trial so it could be um, it could be the sort of stuff that Kristen showed in his demonstration of Vivli information about the trial protocol who the cohort was the, the age group the de the socio demographic all those things which you'd like to metadata about the trial is the first layer. Uh, if you then had applied through an appropriately agreed process to access the um, individual patient data, then you would be granted access to that through the agreed process, but that data would still be held by the node 
but the process of applying for and obtaining it will be managed by the by the federated interface by the that interface layer. Yeah. That um, is, is, yeah. That that's that's uh, that's all very inaccurate. Um, just looking at the the wording in the question, I think I'll just highlight there that yeah we're talking about metadata and not the IPD. So that yes. was that was one distinction. Um, and also just in um, transferability between nodes. Yeah, worth emphasizing uh, as Rhys was that um, we're talking about um, metadata from a node flowing into a federation service um, so that someone could see, uh, you know, metadata from across the nodes. However, we're approaching this uh, as a somewhat open architecture. As I said, the, um, uh, the metadata uh, shouldn't we shouldn't be uh, sensitive information? It should be stuff that um, is is okay to share, okay to make publicly available, uh, and just depending on on um, the exact technical solution that uh, each node comes up with, um, we there is nothing at this stage which precludes nodes being able to see each other's um, data. Uh, I guess the the point I'd simply make is that. Um, our primary focus is on making sure the metadata from the uh, nodes feeds up into a, a federation service. If that also uh, provides functionality and, and benefit for the nodes to see metadata from each other uh, on some technical level, then that's that's a good outcome too. Okay, there is a, a question there that just went to all panelists from Jason Ferris. He said, are groups like Australian Data Archive likely to be incorporated into the ARDC solution so the solution becomes the one-stop shop for all forms of health data? <laughs> that is a, um, uh, in a sense, a big picture question. I'm glad that people are thinking uh, big picture. If you just bear with me, I'm actually just going to um, open the chat and find uh, try and find the um, wording of that, make sure I'm responding to the correct question. Um, so Australian Data Archive, yes, that's that's a, uh, not exactly a general type um, of archive, but it's more general than some. Um, will it be incorporated? I guess that depends on uh, exactly what you mean, but into ARDC solution comes a one-stop shop. Um, so I guess what we're trying to do at this stage of the program um, is develop, uh, and in this design phase specifically, is, is develop um, some, some standards around data practice and the research practice that relates or feeds into that data practice. Um, if that, um, uh, now maybe I'm misinterpreting use of the word forms here, uh, if that results in, in standard uh, forms and yes we would look to share them as widely as possible um, uh, if it's referring to all forms of uh, health research yes the longer term scope for Hasanda is to expand beyond investigator initiated clinical trials as I explained though we, we work to the current MCRIS roadmap um, so that's why we've we've got the current uh, project period set as it is uh, and putting that initial focus on clinical trials um, and yeah um, there has been um, discussion around whether Hassanda could produce essentially off-the-shelf type technology solutions for clinical trials so if, if a clinical trial or the organization that runs it doesn't currently have all the forms or a, or a data repository or data collection tool or whatever it might be, could Hassanda provide that? I think longer term, that's something that we definitely want to look at and see how we might be able to uh, support that. Um, as I said, this first project period is around um, uh, a proof of concept to show that um, there is that appetite and, and building capability into research organizations to um, create some common data standards and practice and an infrastructure to support that and show that we can actually do this with clinical trials. Um, it is achievable. Dash, I'd like to, that sort of leads on to Martin Ebert's question in there, which was obviously what about a prospectively, if there are existing trials, what we'll be hopefully be able to do is to 
when the system at the federated layer is made, it'll be obvious which ones are available. Martin's asking something similar to what Kristen just talked about, which is, will there be a kind of toolbox of things which will allow someone who's now designing a trial, which may not come online for six to 12 months hence, uh, that'll make it easier for them to have the, their standard template for consent, their standard template for of the other things they have to collect. The short answer, the longer, the short answer of that is yes, it won't happen tomorrow, but yes, the standard will, design, if, if you design a set of common data practices, then effectively that's what you will provide as well. And that would be the intention of the project. It may not happen uh, in 12 months, but at some point that's, that is exactly what we want. So that actually moving forward, anyone who's working initially in the clinical trial space and then in other types of studies will be collecting by default data in such a way in their particular state, in their particular node, that the data will be compatible with the sander and will be, and um, it'd be much easier for it to be accessible. Um, that is the intention. Okay, there's a question there from Alison about, is the ARDC aware of the CLIN trial refer? It's clintrialrefer.org.au. I'm personally not, but... Um, yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, there, there, are, um, there are a number of initiatives and technology mm. solutions in this space. Um, and they've definitely come up in consultations with um, various stakeholders and advisory committee. Um, and, you know, part of the work leading up to, to prepare for the working groups and the design phase uh, is to map these all out um, and have an understanding of what that landscape is and um, uh, how to best fit into it. Um, so we do appreciate people, um, even if they are things that we he have heard of before, um, please let us know if it's something you know, we are not a health research organisation, uh, despite some recent my expertise, that's, that's not what ARDC does specifically. So, and as I said, this is co-design. So we rely on people saying, look, this is what we use already or what we want to emulate or whatever it might be. Um, and we won't be reinventing wheels where we don't need to. Um, but through all the consultations that we've held um, and including with those peak national health research organizations, there is definitely a gap in the market here that, um, that AIDC is hoping to fill um, to, to better support um, Australian clinical trialists. And the only other thing I'd say is that obviously our focus is on researchers, not, on, not so much on consumers. Clearly we have to make sure that this is consistent with what consumers expect from clinical trials. But it's, it's not primarily to meant to be a database of currently running clinical trials so that a, either a health professional or a patient can find the one they should enrol in. It's primarily aimed at researchers getting the best use of their data and managing their data the best and also making it available to others for either a secondary research use or perhaps a colleague, a clinical colleague who's working in a similar area. So it, it, the focus for us is primarily on um, primary and secondary use of research data, as Christian mentioned, for things like metadata, for, for designing of new trials, for, for finding existing trials which complement each other. And, you know, also there's a strong market here, a strong component of this where the data can be used for other purpose. You know, you can, you don't, it doesn't have to be a clinician. It can be used for socio, for sociology research. It can be used for data linkage. So that would be my only caveat is that the clinical first site, as I understand it, clinical trial refer is, is more about a catalog of existing trials. We'll have that too, but our focus will be a bit different, be around very much research focused. Okay, thank you. Uh, so did we answer this one? Will any clinical trial registries be linked to this infrastructure? Oh, go ahead. You're muted, Kristen. You're muted, Kristen. We love hearing your voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, yeah, but this came up a lot in, in our consultations. Um, and for those of you who are paying very close attention to the text heavy slides that I was using, um, ANZCTR, so the Australian New Zealand Clinical Trials Registry, uh, one of the organizations represented on our advisory committee. Um, so yes, the efficient way of designing this from a business practice 
perspective, from a technologies perspective, is to um, is to link to the data held in those clinical trial registries. So to, as you said, avoid duplication. Um, and that is very much our intent. Um, the reason why I phrase it that way is that, um, you know, it is actually up to the working groups in the design phase to make the recommendations around that. Um, and so I'm just using the opportunity to say this, you know, this is co-design. We, we collate the feedback, but it's really up for uh, the stakeholders uh, in their communities to say, this is what's going to work for us. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question from Steve McGeckin. Are there plans for variable, variable level metadata per DPUK approach? Sure. I'll jump into that one. But <laughs> you can answer that one. This is this is my language. So DP UK is is the example I showed before. Dementia's Platform UK, um, and uh, the reason why I included that example was um, the the Vivly interface that I showed. Um, it really kind of showed quite a high level of description. Um, you know, what is the trial, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, whereas the um, uh, DP UK example that I was able to show without having to create an account and log in and do all that kind of stuff on screen. Um, what they openly show is that um, description of individual, if people are used to spreadsheet type data, basically the column headings um, uh, or the, the variable name, the variable description um, and a way of categorizing it that way. So that's uh, what that question refers to when it says, would we include variable level metadata? So I think something like that, obviously the more granular you can get, uh, the more powerful your search and discovery uh, is. The, the issue with that, so obviously, you know, that, that's something great to aim for, but the, the um, hard bit of achieving that is that it requires a lot of standardization and clinical trials collect a lot of different kinds of data. Each trial collects lots of different kinds of data um, by necessity, and it might be, uh, is likely to be impractical in, in the next year or two to come up with a, a prescription of how, of what information a clinical trial could collect uh, and, um, and how they should label it and so on. Um, what might be more achievable is to um, is to say, well, rather than the variable level metadata, maybe there will be agreement on um, you know the groups of metadata. So in that example on screen before, we talked about um, socio sociodemographic uh, data, family history data, and so on. So maybe there could be um, some uh, agreement around those kinds of categories. Uh, or maybe you know somewhere between the two, or maybe somewhere higher level again. It's exactly that kind of question, uh, or that kind of decision rather, that the working groups will come up with. Um, and the last point that I'd make around that is that um, not just with this particular issue, with the metadata and informatics stuff, but with the ethics and consent stuff and metadata access stuff, even the scope, why are we just looking at in investigator-initiated clinical trials is because the capacity for scope creep here in this program is through the roof. Um, you know, there, there is a lot of improvement that people can see that is required and can be made. Um, and it's a matter of picking a starting point uh, and, and, you know, not saying that we can solve everything uh, in, in a couple of years. Everyone knows that's not that's not possible. What I think is a more valuable way forward uh, and based on feedback, most, most people seem to agree, is we can use this opportunity to map out the different um, things that could be addressed in an ideal blue sky situation. And, um, and then once we have that map, we can, we can figure out the pathway through that so that we can say, well, this is everything we'd like to achieve uh, maybe in the next couple of years, these are the priority things. And if we just achieve this, we're still making some progress here and um, improving the situation. Yeah. And I was going to say, Steve, that's exactly the sort of thing that the working group will have to decide. 
So the co-design process characteristically balloons out to all these options. And then the working group really has to narrow it down to say what's the what are the priorities, what has to be done as a minimum now. By the, you know, and we've got to decide that by November. Um, and then the other things, as Christian said, become nice to haves or or later developments, um, not inconsistent with the project overall. That's a that's a really good example of the of the sort of decisions that the working group will have to make. What's what are we going to do about this? What's the scope? Um, yeah, what level of detail should we be looking at? There's a Question, Kristen, which um, is sort of also about Vivli, um, yep. which is the, yeah, and you can answer that one. I think I'm at the, I'd say yes, but you can answer it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I think Natasha's back online, had a, had a quick Jeez. technical issue, but I'll just, I'll just proceed. Um, so the question is, do you envisage the Federation services would be similar to the Vivli or Dementia uh, examples, for example, would be uh, it be a, would federation services be a central place to start search and discovery? So um, yeah, look, I mean, I think that's the um, that's very much the kind of uh, functionality um, and probably a lot of the feel that we're looking for in a in a, um, a basic kind of federation service. Um, Hopefully, and I did rush through the examples a little bit and they look a little bit different on screen, but hopefully people could see the commonality between them that you've actually got, um, <clears throat> you know, they're allowed it, allowing you to search through health research studies and kind of see the uh, data and documents that could be made available um, subject to request and approval. Um, and then it's, it's just, you know, there are, there are differences there around, you know, the kinds of health research that's contained within them and the uh, the way it's described and the application process and so on. But that high level functionality is is common. So yeah, I, I think that's really um, the, the Vivlis, the Dementia Platform in the UK, there's a bunch of other ones out there. Um, that really is a, is a primary kind of federation service. So yes, um, the other thing to note about federation services and the comment I made before about this being an open architecture. Um, again, we're going to have to figure out the designs together and what is going to be appropriate, but we don't see, uh, you know, the design of the system or the um, non-sensitive metadata that uh, will be passed on from nodes as being proprietary information or, or restricted information. Um, this kind of broadly falls in the in the category of open science uh, and supporting that kind of ethos. Um, so while we would have to agree together, you know, if if a new group came in and said, we just sort of a great federation service, something new and different to, to Vivli or whatever, we would like to build this. Yeah, we'd have to figure out um, what is our governance process for doing that. And we have bookmarked um, next year as the time to work with uh, the nodes and stakeholders as to what the governance model for the infrastructure will be, separate from, um, from the data governance. Um, but we anticipate that you know, our, our design will be as open as appropriate um, so that people could leverage off you know, the, the uh, metadata that nodes are you know, providing in that standard, standardized format um, and could, you know, build and develop new technologies to, you know, to take the functionality further and make it more useful and improve the research value of the whole thing. Okay, we have come to the end of Q&A and uh, we're coming up to time, Kristen. So any last words? Um, no, thank you everyone for attending and thanks for those questions. They're really good. Um, I am just going to flick back one screen uh, again so you can uh, scan that QR code if you want or if you can remember that ridiculously long URL. <laughs> um, yep, uh, we will be in touch. I'll, I'll be emailing everyone who registered for this event. I know I was contacted by some people saying, oh, I can't actually attend, um, but I've registered because I'm interested. Uh, I'll be emailing you all once we have the um, recording 
up and live. I'll be sending you the link to that. I'll also be sending you um, the information, uh, the URL that you see on screen and any related information um, so that you can uh, learn a little more and hopefully uh, sign up to be a part of this because it's only going to work if everyone is involved. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody, for your support. Great. Thanks, all. Thank you, everyone. Bye now.